good. I might make a start. I kind of let's uh, reward the punctual, if that's the saying, <laughs> which I think think is fair. So hey, thanks so much for for coming today. We're looking forward to today being a nice um, look, casual chat between a lot of people who who love their history, um, and that's the nice thing about today is that we're all in that same boat. Is that um, we love what we're doing, but we've also got that drive to do the best job we can. And that necessitates kind of questions and getting our mind around the new study design. So thanks very much uh, for attending. Yeah, so my name's uh, Richard Malone and I've been uh, an author with Cambridge for a very long time. And as all of the authors kind of in the room, it's it's something we do alongside teaching. So teaching is the passion and um, uh, writing or being involved in authoring is just a bit of, bit of a hobby um, and keeping a sharp on the side so we're all primarily teachers and leaders and um, working with teenagers every day of our lives just like you are so um, I got into uh, revolutions uh, by accident um, in the very first week of my job at a new school the revolutions teacher left and I was asked to pick it up from Monday so I fell into revolutions and have loved it um, ever since and part of that was uh, I had an interview with Cambridge University Press and they came out to my school uh, and in the middle of that, we had a fire uh, fire alarm and I was a warden. So I went and put my hard hat on and we continued the interview sitting on a, uh, a table on the top of the oval while I was trying to count kids and trying to be professional with Cambridge. But it ended up that I've uh, now written for Cambridge, you know, for a long time, uh, like a lot of the authors in the room. And it's been a real, uh, a real joy to really uh, push ourselves in that personal and professional growth. Um, but hey, look, I'd like to start um, this session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet virtually today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today as well. Um, so look, the purpose of today is that we've got a little bit of a background for you. I'd like to kind of introduce the authors who are in our Zoom today. Uh, I'd like to have a chance for each of us to summarise what we think are the main changes in the study design as we all get our heads around how to best prepare uh, our kids for 2022 study design, uh, and then have a chance for anybody here to ask questions of any of us. So we've got a range of authors here today from unit one right through to unit four, um, and in a range of different topics as well. So uh, look, it's my pleasure to introduce um, a whole range of, of really passionate and capable people today. So I'd like to kind of introduce firstly, uh, Dr. Samuel Cohn, and he's the Deputy Director of Teaching and Learning. And he's been involved along with Anthony Coughlin and myself in the Analyzing Modern History Text for Unit 1 and 2. Uh, and Sam is uh, a Deputy Director of Teaching and Learning, plus juggling the Director of Professional Learning at a, at a big school in Melbourne. So he's an internationally recognized scholar in the field of Nazism and religion and has published extensively. I'd um, also like to introduce um, uh, Vince Tui, who's done our American Revol Revolution book for Unit 3 and 4, and he's taught history um, or Aboriginal studies for over 25 years in Sydney and in Melbourne, and for well over a decade, he's been a senior assessor or marker for VCE Revolution history, so his perspective here can be really helpful about exactly what examiners are, are looking for. And he's also lectured regularly on both the American and Russian revolutions, uh, with the HTAB, so you might recognise kind of Vince's face about the American Revolution. Um, also, pleasure to introduce you to Trevor uh, Souden, who has worked on analysing the Chinese Revolution text. Um, and Trevor studied Chinese history at La Trobe University and even kind of worked in China, where he and his wife adopted their Chinese born daughter, which was an Australian first at the time. Uh, and Trevor has taught uh, the Revolutions course for many years has published a lot of things in Agora and has done lots of lectures to teachers and students through HTAV and also Engage as well. So again, um, thanks so much for being here, Trevor, and for that wealth of information that, that you bring. Um, and we've also got Dr. Uh, Dr. Michael Adcock, who has focused on the French Revolution. Um, and he's uh, a really popular lecturer, author and, and tour guide. And again, you might've seen Michael presenting for the HTAV or Modern History Seminars or even at the Gallery of Victoria. And, and Michael even kind of leads uh, as a tour leader for Academy Travel, both here in Australia and, and overseas. So again, that's a, a rich kind of vein of information um, that he brings as well. So um, the team here is primarily uh, people who love their history, but secondarily have been involved in trying to wrestle with the study design and work out what that looks in practice 
um, for our courses and for our kids in our schools. So I've got some questions for each of our authors here, um, just to summarise a little bit uh, about, um, about their focus for their books so you get to understand a little bit more. And then obviously towards the end, we'll give you a chance to uh, ask any questions to anybody of the subjects you actually teach. So the, my first question to our team is, uh, why is your topic so important for students to learn about? You know, what is it that kind of makes the heartbeat of your subject? So but I might start with Michael and the French Revolution. So why is the French Revolution so important for kids to learn about? Uh, a couple of points, Rick. Uh, of course, we study French and Russian, and there's a dichotomy there because you have a revolution that succeeded in creating a modern liberal democracy, which is still functioning today. Uh, but also you have a revolution that goes wrong. Sorry, just one moment. Um, sorry, uh, you have the Russian Revolution, which uh, has some horrific uh, outcomes. Um, the other one is that it introduces students to the process of political and social change that is carried out by force. Bit of a contrast to our own country, uh, which, as Peter McPhee always says, um, is has evolved wonderfully over 200 years since uh, European settlement, not forgetting the much older history of the continent. Uh, and it's happened very largely by fairly peaceful change as well. And that would be my answer, Rick. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we'll throw to you, uh, yeah, Trevor, about the Chinese Revolution. Uh, mute off there, Trev. <laughs> Uh, no, can't hear you yet. The mute button looks like it's still on from our perspective. I think it's in the bottom left. How about now? Yeah, perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. It helps if you can understand, you can hear me, doesn't it? Uh, yep, yes. it's good. <laughs> China has been a passion of mine since... Um, University where I studied under uh, Dr. Jane Leonard and I've always found it fascinating and I think that students and adults do too. China of course is very much part of our news, not always positive with the uh, Wuhan situation, with uh, trade uh, embargoes if you like and uh, political maneuverings but it's important to understand of course how we end up with a China today that is, uh, the party is communist, but China itself is definitely not communist. And how that works out is basically something you need to uh, find out through the history of the country, particularly uh, the last century and a half. Yeah, yeah, thanks Trevor. It's a, certainly a kind of a compelling nation that makes a big impact on Australia today. Uh, so yeah, over to Vince about the American Revolution. Uh, well, America, I've studied at university and I sort of fell in love with the Civil War and sort of just sort of went into it that way. Um, when I came to Victoria, I was like you, Rick, I was thrust into the classroom and told to, you're now teaching double year 12 classes and uh, we do the American Revolution. Um, but that was okay. It was fine. Uh, I found the HCAV book at that stage was the only one, the only resource uh, that you could sort of fall back on. So I was just, and we actually used uh, the Cambridge book um, for Russian Revolution, and the Cambridge book was just so much more user friendly. So that's how I've fallen in with uh, Cambridge to do the American book, uh, which just became a much more user friendly one uh, to use for the staff and for the kids. Uh, look, I, I'm fascinated by America. It's, um, it was, a, it, you know, it's one of the great powers of the 20th century, and are we watching it sort of crumble? Um, while we're teaching the kids at, the, at this time. And I said that, you know, watching an empire dissolve or watching it either just sort of um, on life support, uh, is that what we're witnessing now in the 21st century? Or, you know, will it sustain itself and keep going? Now, while, while Trump was in office, it obviously looked like it was going down the toilet pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I hope the kids have a healthy um, disrespect and, and also awe of America of what it was able to do in the 20th century um, and fight the Nazis and, and fight, uh, you know, fascism uh, in the Pacific as well. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, I was fascinated. The kids, once they've learned one of the revolutions, it really helps as a key to the net understanding another one. Um, 
And I think the American to me is the great disappointment. It offered so much. Um, it was, you know, it could have been a much better world, uh, but unfortunately uh, was frustrated. But look, uh, look, you, you have to do two revolutions. Uh, you've got a good choice out of four. Uh, you have to pick another one. So I'm hoping people will come to the American one. Uh, we only have 10% of the state that does America. So we're a bit of a niche uh, industry. Um, but look, I, I do enjoy teaching it. I enjoy teaching the Russian one as well. Um, and, you know, we're practicing teachers, Rick, as you said. We're, uh, we're not just authors. Uh, we're actually in the classroom. I've never really left it. Uh, 30 years later, still going. So, um, you know, I, I think we've got something of benefit to help the other people out there. Uh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, and I kind of really liked what you said there about the rise and fall of empires. And, you know, for those people who study, you know, the, the ancient empires or, you know, like mm. you're saying now, even kind of, uh, you know, the rise and fall maybe of America, but it's all that questioning and having a chance to look more deeply into the patterns of history that kind of makes it pretty interesting looking at empires today. Um, look, if I can answer my own question about the Russian revolution, I, I think I love that the Russian revolution changes the course of the 20th century. Um, in history, we talk about turning points and the Russian revolution to me is an absolute turning point when one nation begins that socialist experiment and doesn't just change the politics of the 20th century, but the everyday lives of uh, so many people uh, around the world. So I'm really interested as a, say, a social historian in the impact of, of kind of global politics on people's everyday lives. And I feel the Russian Revolution does that in such an in, in incredible way, both positive and negative. So for me, the Russian Revolution is one of those major turning points that I love that you know, kids have a chance to learn about. Um, if I can throw to, yes, yeah, Sam. So the same question about, yeah, why is modern history so important for students to learn about? Well, I think, you know, picking up what everyone's been saying thus far, it's quite clear modern history in many ways picks up all of what you were talking about there in terms of those early revolutionary um, principles and periods, but then also uh, helps students to understand that that's the, the shifting point across the, the course of the modern history, 19th century to 20th century, as a new study design um, outlines, um, to explaining our contemporary world. Uh, and I think that's so integral because uh, often without grasping the processes of major movements, including ideological movements, when you're talking about uh, nationalism and communism, uh, about imperialism, and in fact, frankly, about the shifts of even events like decolonization, you do not grasp that our world is made out of that that he picks up all that exists beforehand. And let's remind ourselves too, revolutionary principles often drew on even classical principles. You know, it's that longer sense of perspective. Uh, but certainly if we want to understand the 21st century and to get students to understand our modern world only appears modern because of many of the shifts that occur over the 19th and 20th century, uh, th then, then that's why sh students need to study it. Uh, my students are constantly surprised when they start to realize, uh, you know, that even the shape of the world as they perceive it, and I mean in terms of states and the formation of states that we take for granted as existing today, uh, only comes out of the 19th and 20th century. That you are talking about a period prior to 1871 of there being no Germany, there being no Italy, uh, let alone talking about the developments of countries like Pakistan or uh, India, for that matter, or even understanding where, why on earth we have a North and a South Korea. And I think that's where that contextual shift uh, is important for students. But I'll follow up on what you're saying, Richard, uh, to my mind as well, Rick. The important point, and I'm sure for all of us we would agree, is to understand this and examine it, but then to understand that we're actors within that history. Uh, and I think for much of that modern period, 19th to 20th century, students can more readily understand that given we have those industrial processes as well as those shifts in perception, particularly around the individual arising from fields, as Michael was saying there, like the French Revolution, frankly, from the Chinese, from the Russian Revolution, from the American Revolution, with the Enlightenment thought and communist thought obviously forming major bases for this. But that creates our modern world. And then when students grasp their actors within it, I would hope they'd also start to understand and, and express a little bit more, as you're saying, of the social history as well, of grasping that actors in the past, people who were living through these periods, most often uh, were like us. You know, they were ordinary people who, who lived through these periods. And to understand that as they operate through what we see today, COVID-19, major shifts in global powers, um, that's exactly what we're studying through the course of the, the modern world. Yeah. Hey, thank, thanks so much, Sam. Uh, yeah. Kind of a love you. love your passion there. And that, 
that's obviously why we're in the room today because that's our you know that's our core love and I think it reminds me of the importance of um transferable skills if we're studying say leadership in the French Revolution or you know the American Revolution what does that how does that help us understand leadership today or if we look at kind of courage or betrayal how does that help us understand humanity today so it's uh fascinating not just in understanding um you know bigger historical movements but also understanding ourselves and and patterns in modern society too um, i'd like to move on now to the study design in particular obviously this was uh postponed for implementation in 2021 and now for 2022 um, so the books that we've prepared are absolutely looking at the changes in the study design, making sure that we've covered any new things or new dates which have come into place, but also trying to get the emphasis you know, right as well. If the study designs want a greater emphasis on X or Y, then we've tried to represent that in the books as well, so that they're the most helpful as possible you know, for our kids. So textbooks seem to have a, a really good purpose as a starting point for kids. It's well structured, it's in front of them, and that can be enhanced with teachers with a range of other sources. But you know, getting a textbook which is reliable for the study design is just kind of gold for those kids who have got so many things kind of coming in and out of their head and the, the pressure associated with that. So our aim is to have uh, books which are, are really faithful to the study design so the kids are as prepared as possible for their SACs and for their exams. So look, I might go around the team again. And for my question this time is, um, what do you think are the biggest study design changes, you know, for your particular area of study, for your topics? And how have you tried to tackle that in the new edition? So what are the changes and what does that actually kind of look like in your book? So, look, I might start with, uh, with Sam with modern history. Absolutely. Happy to speak to that. Um, so the biggest changes as I see, see it in the study design are the way that historical thinking uh, and the principles of historical thinking are being embedded more into the study design. Uh, there are some substantial changes of, of context. Um, certainly there is a drive to try and understand the principle, particularly I think, uh, from uh, historical thinking of changing continuity, but especially that aspect of continuity. So really uh, a lot of the study designers, they're moving it in uh, 2022 is focusing on well how do we understand these principles of social and political change and their impact but across the 19th into the 20th century so really picking up those those larger through lines of lingerie history for example a longer period of history um the uh in terms of the way we've tried to tackle that in the textbook is that the the focus has been very much on uh embedding those principles historical thinking principles throughout the textbook uh, but also trying to provide core examples that link to the ways in which um it, particularly in vce three four exams those historical thinking principles are examined as well so that's meant uh adding new source materials um new uh ideas of historical interpretation and trying to get students to eke out that use of primary and secondary sources more within the textbook as they study the um, as they study the content. So in that sense what we've done is blend skill skills exercises and knowledge. So you're not simply uh, you know focusing on context of course that's absolutely integral but you are ex actually learning some of that context through the practice of skills by analyzing materials from the time or analyzing, of course, historical interpretations um, later on. So that's been the biggest single change, I think, for us. Uh, it's also clear that uh, obviously there's a stronger emphasis in that um, second uh, unit, the unit two, the changing world order, in looking at um, the necessity of examining uh, these bigger ideas of the modern era in the 20th century of decolonization, um, for example, terrorism, uh, and the ways that the world has shifted. And so again, what we have tried to do in the textbook and what we've done in the textbook is add further contextual material around that, but further source material around that. Um, so that it actually helps students in examining this to understand, okay, well, these are living documents of the shifts of the modern world. Um, so I think those are probably the principal ways in which we've done that. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sam. And, um, and VK have also tried to, say, tidy up the Unit 1 and 2 course to, to match the 3, 4 course more closely. So Correct. even the terms of, say, cause and consequence, which is the, the titles of kind of area of studies in in unit three and four are now actually some of the titles in unit one and two. So they've tried to make it a more um, familiar pathway in regards to terminology. And in regards to inquiry tasks, you know, there's that real acknowledgement that there's so many fascinating 
social movements that have occurred throughout the second half of the 20th century and early 21st century, that there's now more scope for students to study a whole range of different kind of ethnic and minority movements as well. So that's True. another nice inclusion. Um, to pick up on, just quickly, I'll pass on to others, but to um, just pick up on that, that's right. And that's embedded throughout the textbook. Yeah, good. Well, if I keep going, uh, keep going backwards, then I'll go to Vince now. So if you're first last time, you'll be last this time. So uh, Vince. Well, just quickly, um, Cambridge has made a pretty good go of making sure the authors stayed uh, right on the money with what the study design changes were and made sure we're accountable and, and every one of those new tweaks, if there is one, uh, that we had to accommodate that in our book and that's exactly what's happened. Um, thankfully, uh, yes, our thing will be still nice and current in the 2026 when it rolls around for the next cycle. Um, America didn't change that much. They, they tweaked some content. They didn't change the parameters of the course. The time periods stayed the same. Uh, all we did, they added a couple of extra things that we just had to cover off on. Um, they probably uh, dumbed down some of the historiography that kids used to slavishly learn and, and just parrot uh, whether a person was left wing or Marxist or neo Whig, um, which was unnecessary and unhelpful. They can do that at uni and have those fights. Um, so expecting a 16 year old year 11 kid doing a three, four, that it would be all across the historiography was probably ambitious. So look, uh, you know, I think the uh, Vic has been sensible and in those changes that they made, uh, the kids have to know some of this stuff, but they don't have to slavishly parrot it like they used to. So look, every chapter has been pretty well done. Uh, it's certainly, I, can't, I can speak for the American book. Uh, we, obviously uh, we've been held accountable to make sure we cover everything that VEEK has asked for. Uh, make sure we cover off on what the exam uh, is asking of the kids and make sure that they send good sample answers uh, are available. Uh, sample questions, sample answers. Um, you know, we've covered that pretty well. Uh, they've also made the book so much more interactive. It's actually dragged an old teacher into the 21st century uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and, is, and it's sort of flying way above my capabilities, uh, but it'll be great for the students because that's the world they live in. Um, and I th I'm probably going against the grain here. Um, a, uh, I'm proving that uh, you actually uh, don't have to have a lot of hair to be a publisher. Um, it looks like Michael and Trevor are against the grain and Sam. Um, and <laughs> Rick and I, anyway, I'm the worst of all of us. But anyway, look, I think, look, the book accommodates uh, all those changes. It does it really well. Um, and I look, I think people, when they, as soon as they open this book up, they'll see that that's what's happened. Uh, it was the only way we could make something sensible that would last for the next four or five years. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Vincent. And I think, um, yeah, that's probably something important to note is that um, all the authors of all the different books, we've, we've followed a really strong template. So there's real consistency between all the different books. So um, you'll find that that sense of, you know, quality and focus on skills kind of coming through in every book so we've certainly worked together to make sure that there's that yeah that sense of benefit and continuity for yeah for every topic that's being talked about uh yeah so trevor on the chinese revolution okay uh actually it is out uh, there it is there and uh it's more than just a cover change of course uh most importantly and uh uh, something that was desperately needed was to go back to uh, the timeline finishing in 1976. Whoever thought that uh, Chinese communist history ended with the death of Lin Biao uh, really uh, weren't thinking. And so I'm very pleased to find that we are back to the death of Mao, which itself uh, has so much interest because all during the time we're seeing this man gather power and why... Uh, no one really successfully challenges him, and they certainly suffer. And to find out what happens when such a person uh, dies and the changes that occur is very important. So that's the most uh, obvious uh, change that uh, the book has um, taken the course back to 1976 with the death of Mao. So uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing was... Um, what have we got here? Um, Yes, uh, the uh, study design talks about the effects on uh, the diverse elements of society. So uh, 
I've actually created a chapter, especially on those groups. So whether it's the soldier, the peasant, the worker, the student, um, the intellectual, the party cadres of that, uh, we want to know what's happened to them over this time period and how they finish. Uh, uh, as an average, of course, individual experiences change, etc. And the course has asked for a little more uh, emphasis on uh, certain things like uh, Mao Zedong thought, which of course permeates the old book, but now there's an extra emphasis on it. And finally, um, Tan Shen, which is the literally turning the body over, which was the communist approach to the new society, gets a little more explicit uh, explanation. And uh, as far as uh, the book itself, the format, there are new illustrations, new documents, trying to uh, show uh, a range and also to challenge students to uh, see different aspects of the what well problems of history, even though, uh, as said before, the problems of history is not emphasised as much. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. It's, it, it's certainly one of the things which um, the new study design has de-emphasised um, so that whole concept of labelling schools of thought has uh, has now been been removed, and that's been a pretty clear directive. So even little things like that are making uh, pretty consistent across the books. Um, and as Trevor said, there's a um, there's been a real um, focus on making the books very very visual. We know that kids live in an absolute visual world, um, not just you know from from their online surfing. So these books are very visual. So what that looks like in practice is that there's visual timelines at the start of each chapter that show the events that this chapter will cover. Um, there's even video summaries um, put together by kind of our author team here at the end of each chapter. So students can read the summaries of each chapter, but they also click on a QR code that gives them kind of a video summarising that chapter. So these books are now incredibly diverse. Uh, and then those students who delve into the interactive textbook even get a lot of those primary sources and, and speeches and images. And so there's an incredible range of, of things which are very targeted at creating this a very three-dimensional book rather than just a two-dimensional text. So there's been a real emphasis on a lot of fantastic kind of visual additions to the text, which I think students will really like. Uh, over to Michael about the French Revolution. Yes. Look, I must say that I uh, agree with Vince entirely that the hidden heroes here are the editors who, from my experience, have just done a superlative job. I pay tribute, first of all, to Nick Alexander, who was responsible for the great leap of the current um, edition of the book, uh, an inspiring and talented editor. And I pay tribute also to Cameron Pico, who just did stellar work, um, sort of getting me to uh, make, make the correct changes and giving me superb guidance. I must say, uh, the, for me, the big relief too is that historiography is gone. Uh, it's, it makes much more sense for secondary school students just to compare and contrast historians' views. They can paraphrase them or quote them, and they can bounce off opposing views to then go on and to say uh, from their interpretation of the revolution, uh, which view is closest to their own. I must tell you the story that uh, my colleague, Glenn Matthews, who was marking revolutions papers was sitting at his desk, uh, marking away, and then suddenly he burst out laughing and almost fell off his chair. And he read out to me that uh, uh, a student had written about uh, that eminent Marxist historian, Michael Adcock, who said, and so on. Very, very funny. Um, look, I find the changes to France uh, relatively modest. Um, I, I looked at the study design today, and I'm pretty sure that the abolition of slavery uh, is gone. I didn't see it there. Um, that's a relief because it's a very unmanageable um, uh, topic for the students. Um, but the, uh, it's actually a continuity that I think, Rick, is the biggest challenge. And that is that they have kept that uh, unit on experiences of groups. I don't have any issue with that. I think it's an excellent uh, question, but it is a game of Russian roulette because quite a number of groups is listed for each revolution and you could be asked about any one or two of them. And I would make this point, which I'm sure other revolutions teachers would agree with. Um, if you're not, if teachers aren't aware that that's coming, then you're going to complete your narrative of the revolution. Then you're going to have to backtrack and 
track what happened to women and track what happened to peasants, then track what happened to wor workers. Uh, but I do make the point that um, Cambridge encouraged me by having a new chapter on the experiences of groups in the French Revolution. And um, also there was already a substantial chapter specifically on women in the French Revolution. So if that is potentially the most challenging aspect of the, of the course, then the book will deal with it very, very effectively. Great, yeah, thank you, Michael. And, and again, if I can kind of yeah, answer my own question for the Russian Revolution, I think there's, um, while there's no date changes, um, for me, that incredible focus on uh, skills um, was a big, uh, a big change. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the first chapter of, uh, of the whole book is about skills and historical thinking. Um, and we worked with the amazing kind of Catherine Hart, kind of put together a chapter at the very start um, of the text, the focus on um, not just explaining historical concepts, but sentence starters and really practical things for kids. How do you know if you've written a good essay, um, et cetera. So it's starting with historical skills, put that um, first and foremost. And it also means at the end of each chapter, our chapter activities, rather than based on here's an essay or here's definitions. Um, and even, even at the end, the chapters are not called end of chapter activities. Uh, at the end of each chapter is called develop your historical thinking skills. So even that change, we've tried to really make sure that the activities are targeted at those historical thinking skills and concepts that we know that they're really looking for in the exam. So it means that some of the activities um, at the end of every chapter are using quotes as evidence or analysing primary sources, or focusing on a key historian, or analysing cause and consequence. So the end of each chapter is totally focused on that whole new approach in the study design. So it's kind of replacing historiography and putting a much deeper focus on um, historical thinking. So the books, all the books are absolutely structured um, in that way. So for example, one of the things that I've done in the Russian book, it had a big focus on uh, worker or soldier letters in mid-1917 as they wrestled with the continuation of World War I by the provisional government and they wrestled um, with uh, the rise of the socialist groups and making sense of those. So there's um, a whole series of letters from Russia in that turmoil um, of the summer of 1917, which obviously then becomes a really important background to the lead into October. So uh, there's a lot of primary sources, a lot of historians' analysis and and that's throughout all the different texts. So um, hopefully that gives you a bit of a summary of, uh, of some of the deeper thinking of how we've tried to adapt the study design to each area of study. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening to that. Hopefully that sparked some questions or you've come with any pre-prepared questions. So would anybody like to have any questions um, and either direct, uh, direct to any of our panel members uh, because you know we love talking history. So we'd love to, to answer any of your questions. So, Anybody brave enough to kick off our first question? If you do, unmute, even put your camera on if you want and, uh, and ask away. You've also got the option of putting a, a question in the chat if you want as well. Hi Rick, it's Paula here from the sales team. How are you guys going? Thanks Paula. Um, I so I just wanted to let you know um, if any questions come up about the uh, from the sales side, um, I'm here to help. But I also wanted to mention um, the teacher resource packages that you guys have put together for um, both modern and revolution. So I was wondering whether you can um, just offer um, the attendees a bit more insight into um, what you've put into that because they are a, an amazing resource. Thank you. Anybody like to answer that one? I know that Anthony is not here tonight. Was you know was pretty key in putting together um, I can... uh, answers to each question. So. Yeah, Sam, you've got anything else there? Yeah, certainly. Um, look, I, absolutely right. Uh, we're aware that people will approach textbooks in different ways. Um, so some of what's been provided here, and uh, if you have a look in the chat, you can sort of see a little bit of a, a rundown of it by Nick Alexander there. Um, but 
the the key is that uh, for teachers who are coming to it the first time, there's also a very rich teacher resource package. So it provides, for example, frameworks of um, how you may wish to uh, teach some of the the content, um, even uh, assessment tasks with um, materials like um, uh, sample assessments or sample responses uh, to help you in in teaching. So in that sense, the if we to use that 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 term that we're all used to as teachers, um, the textbooks are differentiated. Um, they are actually there. They have a lot of resources that if you're very, very uh, confident, you're very comfortable teaching the materials, they're wonderful to use for a richness of resources. Um, so you've actually got, as you've, you pointed out there, Rick, you know, as all of us have pointed out, um, materials, primary sources, secondary sources, letters from the, the Russian period, um, even in the modern textbook, for example, QR codes. So students can experience in that modern history um, archival footage you know, of, of particular events as they occurred. Um, and that's certainly in some online resources that are being put together. But there's also a teacher resource package that comes with this that gives that extra support and certainly does give um, for teachers teaching a subject for the first time, which as you've raised yourself, Rick, can be daunting when, you, when you're suddenly uh, given, given a topic. Um, programs, uh, actual advice on how you might lay out the, the coursework, how you might work best with the textbook, uh, and even um, sample assessment tasks if people wish to use those um, uh, in order to build up their own assessment tasks for their students. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, the real strength of the teacher, you know, support packs that they've put together by practising teachers who understand what's possible for kids to answer in time limits. Um, rather than say perfect adult or tertiary answers. So um, the aim is that we essentially try and create a bit of a one-stop shop for people who just need a bit of a, a backup. Um, we all know that um, there's incredible amount of re uh, fantastic resources on the internet, but that also means that kids will waste a lot of time searching to try and find the good things. So part of the advantage for me of a textbook is that we've been that filter of searching through hundreds of resources to find the ones which we think are most powerful and then publishing um, them both in the interactive book and also the hard copy book as well. So um, we find that starting with a textbook is a bit of a time saver for your kids because they can get down to the things which are really important. So even if you time, if you Google for a timeline, you might get hundreds of different things, whereas mm. the aim is the textbooks will have the, uh, the, the dates that you really need to know for year 12 study. Um, so we find that these texts have been thoroughly scoured as a really good starting point that gets to the stuff that the kids really need to know rather than hours on the internet, not knowing if it's actually really important or just bonus information. So the teacher pack is uh, aimed at really honing in on exactly what's important for us here in Victoria. And any other questions for us? Can I just add a little bit to that, Rick, because I know for a fact uh, it's not only, um, as you said, teachers who are used to teaching it, understanding what, what kinds of, um, what might be feasible for a student to do in a, a fixed period of time. Um, but Vince, I, I don't know if you'd care to comment on this, but I certainly know that some of the examples and some of the things that are used are actual student uh, you know, so, sort of based on actual student response. Um, that is, you know, understanding exactly what students are capable of and, and how they might write to this um, out, of, out of student responses. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can't ask the kids to perform in the VC exam if you haven't actually put them through the rigours of what, they're, what they have to actually do. So they could write a great essay over 45 minutes, but there's nowhere in the exam that's asking them to do that. So yeah, you really have to do put them through their paces um, in class. Um, uh, like when I, was at Saint, when I was at St. Kevin's, I mean, we would regularly uh, on a Friday, that, that Friday afternoon would be a regular, some kind of uh, answer a, a question against the clock. And, you know, you have 15 minutes to write this response because that's what you have in the VCE. Um, and, and, you know, uh, kids are incredible what kids can, can do and then you know a really good answer would be sampled and given to the rest of the kids and I mean that's what we've put in the book we put in there some of these sample answers um, um, and you know you sort of you stand on the shoulders of giants that went before you um, we've been helped by a lot of good kids that have come before and their work is available like uh, I'm sure most of the teachers have a, some kind of portal or flip classroom set up where the kids can dip into um, and we definitely have that as well I mean the book is one resource but then there's 
that, that flip classroom model of where the kids can go to the portal and we have a lot of these great sample answers there as well. Um, yeah, look, I, I think I was helped a lot when I first started in Victoria um, by some great teachers just reaching out to some of the teachers that were either doing those lectures at HTAV or ones you met at marking. And people are very generous, like, uh, uh, you know, in handing out the materials. And I was amazed, uh, you know, once I, I, I'd emailed a person about, you know, could I have some resources? And they sent me this massive, it's a bit old school now, CD of images. And it was just amazing. I just thought, that's so generous. I mean, I came from the New South Wales system, where it, was, it looked like every man for himself. And I was quite taken back by the generosity of some of the people in the Victorian system. Um, and that's helped me be a better teacher. And I've tried to, do, I've tried to help other people who, who, who uh, contact us. So I'm sure anyone out there in uh, HTAV land, uh, sorry, um, or, or Vika land, uh, who, uh, in teaching land, that needs help, yeah, I, I'm sure all the authors here would help you at least get started, get off the, get, get away from scratch and off you go. Uh, because you only just need that, you need just that little push sometimes and uh, you're on your way. Yeah, and, and that's certainly part of, you know, um, all of us are the, the products of the professional generosity of people who've gone before us and, and part of, you know, for us, how our heart beats that these books are sharing that professional generosity back in return. And, um, you know, there's some terrific sources, you know, out there, there's terrific explanations and the aim is to create books uh, that are absolutely engaging for your top learners and for your kind of beginning learners who need things to be scaffolded as well. So, the aim is that the books are actually very differentiated, very visual. Um, there's a lot of things that that move and shake and a, and a lot of incredible access to sources um, that are totally different to textbooks of 20 years ago, which were really just a lot of black and white text. So textbooks are absolutely evolving as time is evolving, um, which means at the end of the day, kids and their learning and their understanding of these incredible periods in history is actually really enhanced. So I think these uh, these books fulfil that in uh, absolutely every way and provide a real security for kids in having that story or that narrative and then the deeper understanding of what the examiners are looking for all in the one place that then teachers can supplement with any of your you know kind of pet resources so um, we feel this is just an, an, an incredible starting point um, because it's now far more than just text and the QR codes the, the summaries the being able to access the primary sources uh, speeches etc makes it uh, incredibly interactive from the stereotype of what a textbook was 20 years ago. Good, does anybody else have any other uh, questions that we can answer or something to put in, into the chat? We're happy to help out in any way we can. Um, Rick, I just, I thought I would point out too um, for the, the teachers that are here today, um, we're, we're in a really um, enviable position with the, um, with the delay to the study design because it means we you know as, as Trevor mentioned earlier we've got books now um, I think the French one is due to arrive in a, just a few days and um, so you know we'll be able to put copies of there you go there's the modern history <laughs> thank you Sam um, yeah we'll be able to put books in hands um, you know this term so that's um, that's really exciting Nick's just put a bit of availability info in the chat there for anyone who wants to look at that but I'd encourage you to um, to reach out to your your Cambridge rep who has probably been pestering you about these books. Um, there's quite a few of them, as you know. Um, yeah, if anyone wanted to wants to see a copy, we we can actually you know get um, get a copy out to you, which is really exciting. Mm. Yeah, and that's great. I mean, uh, as a teacher, there's you know um, there's no comparison to actually flicking through a book, seeing what it looks like, seeing what first impressions are, etc. So. There's kind of a really nice list um, up there in the chat about when the books are coming. So there's some of the books are available in hard copy right now. Uh, and for those others which are coming, say, in, in September or beyond, then there's sample pages that you can also receive so you can see exactly what it's like, what type of activities are there for kids that match the exams, uh, what's the formatting like, is it engaging to look at? Um, so there's a, a lot of options for actually the accessing textbooks now or sample pages. So again, again, there's some information there in the chat. So feel free to contact Cambridge if you're interested in actually getting your hands on some of these materials, just so that you can see for yourself, you know, some of the things we've talked about verbally today, what it actually looks like in practice on a page, even, you know, kind of get your phone and click on some of the QR codes and 
see the type of resources or video summaries that are behind it as well. So there's nothing better than actually exploring a book and getting your own impression on that. So do contact kind of Cambridge and get some of those uh, samples or textbooks themselves so that you can see what we think good history looks like in practice. And not to put too fine a point on it, but obviously as uh, we're sitting in Victoria waiting for announcements of uh, what's going to happen next uh, in terms of whether we're back into another lockdown, uh, one of the benefits of uh, certainly some of the textbooks is the interactive nature of them. That there are, there's a resources available online. It's an interactive textbook, for example, with modern history. Um, and that sort of aspect through Cambridge, I think, is, is a great benefit because it does mean, uh, as many people realise, um, one of the norms of teaching has become having to teach online. Um, you, you get that capacity to be able to keep up with, with the students, the students be able to keep up through that as well. Yep. And that's great. And look, in the chat there, there's a, a list of what the hard copy books cost but also what the digital books cost. I remember you know, when digital books first came out, they were simply just a PDF of the actually the hard copy book. And it was no difference, different at all. Whereas these actually have an incredible extra range of, of resources. So we call it an interactive text because it's exactly that. It's not just a, you know, a, a poorer copy of the hard, of the hard copy. So um, the digital text offers so much and a lot of schools are going digital rather than hard copies. And but there's the option for kids and for schools about what um, yeah, what method or resource actually best best suits. I've also seen there's also kind of the link to the sample pages there. So feel free to kind of copy that link so you can actually access some of the sample pages um, for the different revolutions and, and, uh, and the modern text as well. So again, you can kind of see for yourself uh, what these book, books look like in practice, right from the, the introductory timelines and overviews and, and, uh, and flow charts, right through to the end of chapter activities that prepare kids for the exam style questions. 